Hey, welcome to Growth Track. My name is Dawn Williamson. I am one of the campus pastors at Church of the Heartland in Winnemac. This is Pentateuch 2. This is session one of eight. Uh, my email address, if you have any questions, is godsgarden223 at gmail.com. And if you'd like college credit for this class, go to churchoftheheartland.com, click on the Growth Track page. Um, there's some requirements there and some information. Or if you wanted to just take this class for information, that's great. Um, we're happy that you're here. But let's just open in prayer. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for this time, Lord. I thank you for these people that are here in person, Lord. I thank you for everyone that's online taking these classes. Lord, I just pray that this class just reveals some new things to all of us, Lord, that it encourages us to just continue to seek your face and continue to spread your word. Lord, be with me tonight as you use me. Let every word that comes out of my mouth come from you. In Jesus' name we all said, amen. All right, so this is Pentateuch 2. Um, this is in the Old Testament. And sometimes we think that the Old Testament is no longer relevant, um, that Jesus came and that we have the New Testament. But that is far from the truth. There are so many things that we need to learn from the Old Testament. Now, Pentateuch means five scrolls or books. And um, in Pentateuch 1, the class for Growth Track, we covered Genesis, Pastor Swy or Dr. Swihart covered that. But we'll be covering the next four books, Exodus, Leviticus, um, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Now, Pentateuch itself is not a word that you would hear in the Bible. It is nowhere on the pages of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> but Penta is five, just like Pentagram, Penta, Pentagon. But in te Tuk is scroll. Back in biblical times, they didn't actually have pages like we do in a book, but they wrote everything out in a scroll. So the first five books, the Pentateuch, were written by Moses, except for the last um, book of Deuteronomy in the last couple chapters. It is thought that that was written by uh, Joshua because it is about Moses' death. So he couldn't have wrote them, and they do believe it was Joshua. Now, the first five books are also called the Torah, and Hebrew name for Torah is Law or Instructions for Life. Now, um, there are 613 instructions in the Torah. Now, we are just um, learning in church right now. We're going over the New Testament, the Sermon of the Mount, and Jesus is giving the new instructions for life. Um, in the Old Testament, it was Moses um, and also the Ten Commandments. The New Testament, it's Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, the date Exodus was written is uncertain, but they do believe it's from 1450 to 1410 B.C. And, of course, the main figure in the book of Exodus is Moses. Now, he was considered at the time to be the most important Jewish prophet in the Old Testament. He was also a teacher, a leader, and a deliverer. And the key theme of Exodus is that God sets us free. He delivers us. And he delivers us so that we can serve him. That's the purpose, not to just deliver us from something and then do what we want. He delivers us from things, and so we can serve him and know who he is. Um, it's also to remember who came before us. It's important that we know our history. And um, all of us Christians here, we've had people go before us, all those pilgrims before us. And we need to know who they are, what they did. Of course, we're not going to know every single one of them, but um, there's some big... Um, parts of our history that we need to know, just like Church of the Heartland. Um, Church of the Heartland this year was founded 35 years ago, and we need to know who those founders are. Our founders are Pastor Herb and Pastor Sandy Hyatt. They founded Church of the Heartland 35 years ago. We need to know who built this church, Pastor Jim, Pastor Michelle. And then we need to know why we're in Bible college. Who set this in motion? This was set in motion by Pastor Herb and Pastor Sandy. They were needing leaders and it's easy to just maybe go out, find a leader, hire them in, and bring them in. Um, but they wanted to build from inside, to know those people, have relationships. That's why you guys are here, here to build you up so that you can be the leaders, the next leaders. Um, so that's, those things are important. Um, and if you ask any one of those pastors, um, they want no glory for themselves. They've done the work, but they give all the glory to God, and that is so important. So we're going to look at some stories, key stories in Exodus. <clears throat> now, the book of Exodus is called the Book of Names by the Jewish rabbis because chapter 1 starts out with the names of the sons of Jacob 
whose name is also Israel. Now he brought his family, family to Egypt from the famine in Canaan. Now God was going to use the Israelites' experiences in Egypt to prepare them for the special tasks that he had um, for them to accomplish in their own lives. In other words, three main ones. First was to be the witnesses of God, the true living God. They were to see all the miracles, they were to know who he was, and they were to spread that word. Number two, to write the Holy Scriptures. If, they, if Moses wouldn't have wrote these words on a scroll, then we would have myths and legends. Stories would have changed, um, but it's very important that he was to put that pen that in, in the scrolls. And then thirdly, it was to bring the Savior into the world through their bloodline. They needed to stay alive, they needed to uh, produce, reproduce, um, so that the Messiah could be b born later, years later. Now, Exodus itself has deliverance written all over the pages, and you can't have deliverance if you don't have a deliverer. So in chapter 1, it tells us that the Israelites were filling the land, they were multiplying, and the new king of Egypt, Pharaoh, was getting scared and let fear get the best of him. Now, you're going to see Pharaoh's name all through um, Exodus. Well, it's not the same Pharaoh. There was generations but um, Pharaoh, this new king Pharaoh, he was getting scared. Now the Egyptians were being outnumbered and the king wanted to make a plan so that that would stop and they would stop growing them. So when fear takes over our lives, we do some pretty foolish things. Um, the Egyptians made their Israelites, the Israelites their slaves and they were brutal. They were just terrible to them. It says they worked the people of Israel without mercy they made their lives bitter and forced them to make bricks and work the fields. They were ruthless. Now, if that wasn't enough, the king, Pharaoh, decided to order the Hebrew midwives to kill all the newborn baby boys um, as soon as they were born. So the midwives were supposed to go there, be at the birth, and kill the babies. Now, when people, um, when people say jealousy kills, this is a prime example Jealousy not only kills relationships, it kills friendships. Sometimes it actually makes you kill people. And that's exactly what Pharaoh was doing. He was so jealous of the numbers that they had that he was going to stop it. But here's a cool thing. The midwives, the Hebrew midwives, they feared the Lord. They feared the Lord more than they were going to obey the king. Now, when the king asked them, like, why aren't you killing these babies? They told him that they were not there in time for the births. Now, this is the first instance in Scripture of what we call today civil disobedience, refusing to obey an evil law because of a higher good. Uh, this is what Romans 5.29 says, When the laws of God are contrary to the laws of man, then we ought to obey God rather, rather than man. Now, some scholars say that the midwives weren't actually lying because you think, well, they lied to the king. But um, some of them say that they actually sent their assistants late so that they couldn't be there in time to do that. Now God, it says that God blessed those midwives for their faithfulness and gave them babies of their own. And it was a really hard time to have a baby, but he obviously protected them too. He wouldn't have let them have babies and then take them away. <clears throat> so um, this wasn't going to stop the king. He was going to continue to try to kill the newborn boys. And he told everyone to throw the boys into the Nile River to be drowned. Now, that was not just the Hebrew midwives' job. It was all everyone's job, the Egyptians' jobs. So they were to look out for him, and they were to kill him. But there was one boy that would be born that Pharaoh could not kill, and that leads to Exodus 2. Now, Moses' parents, they were listed in Hebrews 11 um, in the Hall of Faith because they disobeyed the king's command and hid their boy after he was born. Hebrews 11:23 says this, it was by faith that Moses' parents hid him for three months when he was born. They saw that God had given him and them an unusual child, and they were not afraid to disobey the king's command. Now Moses had an older sister, Miriam, and an older brother, Aaron. Um, from the very start, Moses was seen to be no ordinary child, and it was evident that God had a purpose for him. Exodus 2, 2 through 4 says, The woman became pregnant and gave birth to a son, she saw that he was a special baby and kept him hidden for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a basket made of papyrus reed and waterproofed it with tar and pitch. She put the baby in the basket and laid it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile River. The baby's sister, Miriam, 
then stood at a distance watching to see what would happen to him. Now, can you imagine hiding a baby for three months? That's one thing to hide your pregnant for three months, but to hide an actual baby that was born for three months was quite a task. And then the dreaded day came that she knew she no longer could hide that baby and she had to do something. So let's talk about the basket. The basket is so cool. When I first learned this years ago, it was like it excited me. And I hope it, ex it excites you as well to just be like, there's so much in this Bible that we don't even know. I mean, that's why it's so cool that you're here and just learning. Now, there's a significance in Genesis and here in Exodus. The basket that would hold the deliverer of the Israelite perils, or parallels the, ba the boat that carried Noah and his family that would save mankind. Now, papyrus reed was very strong, and they were used to make boats. Dried papyrus is four times more buoyant than balsa wood. Now, both the ark and the basket were waterproofed. Now, we think this makes sense, right? You'd make a boat, you waterproof it, tar and pitch. Why? Because we don't want leaks and we don't want it to sink. But here, this, this is the cool part. Pitch is defined as covering, or the Hebrew translation is atonement. It was covering those, the boat and the basket. Genesis is the first mention of atonement in the Bible with Noah. Genesis 16, 4 says, So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. Then in an exodus with Moses, which we just read. And then guess what? In the New Testament with Jesus. 1 John 2, 2 says, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Atonement means the reconciliation of God and mankind. I'll say that again. Atonement means the reconciliation of God and mankind. In the times of Noah, they didn't want anything to do with God. God Noah was the only righteous one. In the times of Moses, God, had, God wanted the killing of innocent babies stopped and he wanted the Israelites free to go back to, to be back with him and in his holy land and in the times of Jesus in the times right now he wants to have a relationship with every single one of us and it's our jobs to know God and then help others know him as well all right so back to Moses now Pharaoh's daughter was bathing in the water and saw the basket with Moses in it now she must have heard that baby crying so she got one of her attendants she did get the basket, and they, they, she found Moses. Now, she immediately knew that it must be one of the Hebrew babies. So why didn't she kill him? She was supposed to, especially she was the daughter of the king. And once again, someone went against man's law, knowing they were doing the right thing and not killing that baby. Now, Miriam, Moses' sister, saw this because what is she doing? She was watching the basket. She approached the princess and asked if she wanted her to find a Hebrew woman to feed this baby. Now, that was brilliant. She was gonna, Moses was going to go back to his mom. She was going to get her son back to raise for a while. And his mom fed him and raised him until it was time to give him back to the princess. Now, most, most scholars think that it was between two and three years. And Moses was then adopted by the princess, which means that he would have special favor he would have a special position, and he would give, be given special education. Now, the princess gave Moses his name, which means I drew him out of the water. And now this is all we really know about Moses until the Bible says um, he had grown up. And it's just like Jesus' younger years. We know about his birth. We see a little bit maybe in here, and then we don't know much until his ministry was really to start. So that's kind of a parallel, too. We do know this from Acts 7.22. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptian and was mighty in words and deeds. And we're going to, that words, he was mighty in words and deeds. We'll talk about that later. He was smart, strong, wise, and educated. Moses also knew he was a Hebrew. So did he remember this from his biological mother? Or did the princess teach him that he was a Hebrew? Now, I would suspect it was a combination of both, but I would think the princess had a big contribution to him knowing his heritage. 
If the princess had hated the Hebrews and did what she was instructed to do, she would have taken him out of the basket and killed him. But I would suspect that she loved him as her own and was honest with him about his history, especially if like you found this baby in this basket and then you want to save it and then two or three years later, this baby's going to come back. Maybe some of that newness or that cuteness would have worn off, but it didn't. She took him back. Now Moses, he couldn't help but help his, help his own people. Scripture tells us that he wanted to visit, he went to visit the Hebrews and he saw how the Egyptians were treating them. Exodus 2, 11 through 12 says, many years later, when Moses had grown up, he went out to visit his people, the Hebrews, and he saw how hard they were forced to work. During his visit, he saw an Egyptian beating one of his fellow Hebrews. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. Now he saw an Egyptian hurting a Hebrew man. Now some scholars think that the slave drivers were not just disciplining the Jewish um, slave, that it was probably beating him to death. And Moses was probably saving someone's life, just like the mom and the princess, his mom and the princess saved his. It was in his DNA already. Now he ended up killing the Egyptian and hiding him in the sand. But what didn't he do? He didn't consult with God and took matters into his own hands. What would God have told him to do? Maybe he would have told him the same, but he didn't ask the question. We don't know. He didn't ask. He didn't give the opportunity for God to do that. So he chose fear over faith and anger over obedience. He thought no, no one saw him, but another Jewish slave did see him kill the Egyptian. So Moses got scared and he fled to Midian. So you see, Moses had flaws. He murdered someone tried to hide his sin, and ran and lived in fear. Just like us, do we try to hide our sins? I know I have done that. Somehow we think we can get away with stuff, especially if no one's watching. But there is someone who is always watching and always seeing. You see, God was still going to use Moses, just like he wants to use any of us with our flaws, no matter what we've done. We just have to admit that we have those flaws Believe by faith that we're forgiven and choose to follow God and his orders. We should never allow the enemy to use our sins against us from serving God and his people. But the best thing that we can do in any circumstance in our life is to ask God first, just like Moses should have asked what he should do to that slave driver. If Moses would have asked him, we don't know how things would have turned out, but they surely would have turned out differently. So Moses had now become a fugitive of Midian. The man who was mighty in word and deed is now a lonely, in the lonely pastures taking care of stubborn sheep. Now he grew up a son of a princess, and now he's out in the field. Our actions have consequences, good or bad. But taking care of these stubborn sheep was just the kind of preparation Moses needed for leading a nation of stubborn people. Israel was God's flock, special flock. Psalm 103 says, acknowledge the Lord is God. He made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. And Moses, he was his chosen shepherd. Just like Joseph's 13 years as a slave in Egypt and Paul's three years hiatus after his conversion, Moses' 40 years of waiting and working prepared him for a lifetime of faithful ministry. Now, God doesn't lay hands suddenly on his servant. Sometimes he can, but most of the time, he takes the time to equip them for his special work. Now, today we live in a now society. We want to be the CEO now. We want a shiny new car now. We want the big house now. We want to be the preacher now. God may do those things, those things sometimes now, but mostly we have to do some work first. God delays in what we want. God's delays in what we want are not his way of saying no or that he doesn't care. Now he hears our prayers, he knows our sorrows, and re he remembers the promises he has made to us. What he, pro he promises us or you individually, if you know God's talked to you and he promised you something, he will deliver. 
Now we've just talked about this in one of our sermons not too long ago. Psalm 27, 14 says, wait patiently for the Lord, be brave and contagious. I knew I was going to say it, not contagious, courageous. I practiced that three times and every time I said contagious, courageous. <laughs> Let me say that again. Be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. The word wait doesn't just mean to sit around and wait. It means to serve. Serve him, serve family, serve friends, serve people. It's like a server in a restaurant. They wait on people. Wait to see who needs what you need next. But while they're serving you, they're serving someone else. They just don't watch you eat every bite and then be prepared to serve you some more. They're constantly moving and working. Now, once in Midian, Moses was at it again. He was helping people. He rescued some girls from shepherds and helped them get some water. Exodus 2, 17 says, But some other shepherds came and chased them away. So Moses jumped up and rescued the girls from the shepherds. Then he drew water for their flocks. Now the girl's father invited Moses to dinner and gave him his daughter Zipporah to be his wife. Can you imagine you just like help someone with water and then you have a wife? <laughs> it doesn't work like that it's too much anymore. But anyways, um, scripture tells us that Moses stayed in Midian for 40 years and had a family, but the Hebrews were still enslaved in Egypt and God knew it was about time that they were going to get him out of there. Now, 40 in the Bible symbolizes a period of testing. It is mentioned 146 times in scriptures. Names like Moses, Jesus, Jonah, Ezekiel, Elijah, Saul, David, Solomon, they all had reference to 40, whether it was 40 years or 40 days. That brings us to Exodus 3. It's the deliverer is called. Exodus 3, 1 through 3 says, One day Moses was tending the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock far into the wilderness and came to Sinai, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a blazing fire from the middle of the bush. Moses stared in amazement. Though the bush was engulfed in flames, it didn't burn up. This is amazing, Joseph said to himself. Why isn't this bush burning up? I must go and see it. Now in verse 1, Here's something important. God calls people who are busy. Moses was tending the flocks. Busy. We got to stay busy. Here are some examples. Gideon was threshing grain. Samuel was serving in the tabernacle. David was caring for sheep. Elijah was plowing. Four of the disciples, the apostles, were managing their fishing business. And Matthew was collecting taxes. God does not like laziness. In fact, he has a lot to say about idle hands. Here are just a couple of scriptures for you. There's plenty, but I'm just going to give you two. Proverbs 24, 30 through 34 says, I walk by the field of a lazy person. The vineyard of one was no, with no common sense. I saw that it was overgrown with nettles. It was covered with weeds and its walls were broken down. Then, as I looked and thought about it, I learned this lesson. A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack like an armed robber. That one hurt because sometimes I like to sleep. Sometimes I like to have idle hands. So, I don't know, right in the heart. Matthew 25, 26, 27, this is Jesus talking here. He says, but the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I harvested crops, I didn't plant and gathered crops, I didn't cultivate. Why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I would have gotten some interest on it. In verse 3, Moses says, This is amazing. Why isn't this bush burning up? I must go see it. Can you imagine that? Seeing a bush on fire, but nothing's happening. God is intriguing. We should want to get closer to him. To see his power in the miracles he performs. That bush should have burned up. Just like the tongues of fire should have burned the disciples in the upper room. They both saw the power of God and how Moses and the disciples, with God's help, can accomplish anything. With God's help, we can accomplish anything. We can't do anything on our own. In verse 5, he told Moses not to come any closer. Exodus 3, 5 through 6 says, Don't, Do not come any closer, the Lord warned. Take off your sandals, for you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your father the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. 
When Moses heard this, he covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Moses was about to walk on holy ground. Verse 5 shows that God wants to speak to us, and he does speak to us, but we need to take it seriously. If Moses would not have listened to the instructions of God, of the Lord, he would have died. Sometimes I think we lack the reverence, the holy fear of God. Not fear like a scared puppy, but the fear of not obeying. Do you have a fear? Do you have a fear of like maybe going to jail perhaps? I know that's a fear. Um, I have this weird fear of losing my teeth. I have this fear. Ask my husband and my friends, like I have this weird way of brushing my teeth. I do it because I'm afraid they're going to fall out. I appreciate and respect my teeth. In the same way, it's the same with God. We should not want to um, let him down. We should have a weird way of respecting God. Not like a weirdo kind of religious way that other people would think is a weird way, but the world should see us different. We shouldn't just blend into the world. We need to show a reverence to him. In verse 7 through 9, it says, God is getting Mo In verse 7 through 9, God is getting Moses ready to go to work for him. That is the same that you are doing right now. You're getting ready to go work for God. You're in training. Now, you already may be working for God, but there's more that you can do. Like I said before, God calls the ones who are busy. Verse 10 says, um, verse 10, God sends Moses. Now go, for I am sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people out of Egypt. This was a huge task. These are God's chosen people, his prized possessions. But what does Moses do? He starts to protest and make excuses why he wasn't equipped, how God should pick someone else to handle the job. And we, see, we need to stop making excuses for ourselves. Moses should have said, here I am, Lord, send me. Same with us. If you're asked to teach a Bible college class, you say yes. If you're asked to do announcements in church, you say yes. If you're asked to help at kids camp, you say yes. If you are asked to help with tables and chairs, you say yes. You may be scared. You may be, feel unqualified. You may be intimidated. You may have 17 reasons why to say no, but say yes. Yes to God. Yes to calling from the burning bush. Just one more chapter before we take a break. Exodus 4. Moses continues to protest in the calling um, of going to Pharaoh to let the Israelites go free from slavery. Here's how Moses is described in the Wearsby commentary. Moses should have rejoiced because God was at last answering prayers, and he should have submitted to God's will, saying, Here I am, send me. But instead, he argued with the Lord and tried to escape the divine calling to rescue Israel from slavery. In Egypt, 40 years before, Moses had acted like the impetuous horse and rushed ahead of God. But now he's acting like a stubborn mule and resisting God. Moses gave five reasons why he couldn't accept God's call. Number one, I'm a nobody. What Moses or we think about ourselves is unimportant. It's what God says about us is what is important. Again, if he calls you to do something, we do it. Second, I don't know your name. Moses was saying, I'm not really sure I know how to describe you. God said, you tell them, I am. Jesus says the same thing about himself in the Gospel of John. He is, he always was, he always will be. We just need to get that into our hearts. Third, the elders won't believe me. When we say that someone won't believe us, it's because we don't believe it ourselves. But God showed Moses miracle after miracle, showing his power. And once again, the power that Moses possessed was not his own power, but the power of God. Next one, I'm not a fluent speaker. Moses just didn't get it. And how did it say before he was, um, he was good in speech, right? Isn't that how it described him? He says, um, oh, Lord, please send someone else to do it. Or I'm sorry, I'm the speaker. Moses just didn't get it. If God could turn rods into serpents and serpents into rods, if he can cause and cure leprosy, if he can turn water into blood, then he can enable Moses to speak his word with power. And lastly, he said, someone else can do it better. In verse 13, Moses said, Oh Lord, please send someone else to do it. Moses acknowledges that God is the Lord. He said, Oh Lord, but then refuses to obey his orders. Do we do the same? 
we know we know the lord we claim to know him but then when he asks you to step out and help a neighbor or helps a family member or make reconciliation with someone do we do it do we think someone else is better qualified how about the reverse when i when asked to do god's work do we think we're overqualified someone else can clean up the bathroom we don't have to do that the chairs and the tables the best place for us to be is right in God's will. Sometimes that's cleaning up after kids' camp. Sometimes it's teaching in kids' camp. We need to be busy. We're going to be called. Verse 14 says, Then the Lord became angry with Moses. God allowed Aaron, Moses' brother, to be his mouth, mouthpiece for him. God could have got the d job done with or without Moses' help. <clears throat> it's fine to have confidence in numbers, but Moses could have done this alone just with God. Verse 18 through 19 says, So Moses went back home to Jethro, his father-in-law. Please let me return to my relatives in Egypt. I don't even know if they're still alive. Go in peace, Jethro replied. Before Moses left Midian, the Lord said to him, Return to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you have died. Everything was set up. He knew that he was supposed to go. He got permission from Jethro and God. Um... I'm sorry. Yep, he knew he was supposed to go. He got permission from Jethro and God. Moses headed back to Egypt with his family, his wife, and with the staff of God in his hand. But there was one loose end that needed to be um, put back in order. Um, scholars say that Moses' second son was not circumcised, and God was angry, and he was going to kill Moses because it was like, okay, go, and then all of a sudden it was like God was going to kill him. But it says um, Zipporah went ahead and circumcised their child. Now they think that she saw the circumcision of the first boy and she didn't like it, so she didn't want the second one circumcised. So she alone took that upon herself and she circumcised him. And then the Lord left Moses alone. See, ne things need to be lined up in our lives. If there's some loose ends that we need to fix up, we need to do that. And then Marin Aaron met up with Moses at Mount Sinai and they would be companions for the next 40 years. When it comes to serving the Lord, it is two are better than one. And when Moses and Aaron went back to Egypt, they called all the elders of Israel together. Aaron told them everything that the Lord had said, and they performed miracles. The Israelites were convinced that God had sent them, and they all bowed down in worship. All right, and we'll start in Exodus 5. When we come back, we'll take a break. <laughs> 